So this session is the state of the industry. So we've gone from looking at a global perspective to looking at South Australia. We're going to go through each of the major varieties and uh, our panel is going to comment from different perspectives. So the first variety we're going to look at is Shiraz as the major variety in Australia. So Sandy, if you'd like to give us um, a picture of the 2015 vintage. As um, was the case nationally, the crush of Shiraz was slightly down. 209,000 though, which is half of the red crush, just slightly down across the state. Uh, we had average prices up, very significantly up in the Barossa and the Adelaide Hills. Um, prices were down in Riverland and Langhorn Creek. Barossa Valley recorded the highest price ever for Shiraz, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and then the other thing to look at is that we've had 935 hectares of new plantings of Shiraz in South Australia in the last two years, um, but a net increase of 560. So there's, you know, there's another 350 or so that have been pulled out. But if you think that they've already been pulled out, so whatever we crushed this year, we've got the 900 odd hectares to add on top of that down the track, but it still seems reasonably um, conservative and restrained to me, another 900 hectares. And they were mainly planted in, guess, the Barossa and uh, McLaren Vale. So Peter, if you put the next one up, please. Um, I think, the take, take your time with this for your own region, what you're interested in. Just to note that um, prices were up, but not consistently up. They were down a little bit in the Riverland and Coonawarra. Um, and the next one, Peter. The, uh, the, the Phylloxera board, as you know, has been collecting statistics on the wine industry for a long time, and um, that's probably going to be taken over by Wine Australia now, but we've kept a really good historical series. And if you look at that chart, you can see weighted average prices for Shiraz, no adjustments for CPI or anything, going right back to 1996. And that shows you how the Barossa has now hit a new all-time high, which is nice to see. And they're all pretty well trending up, except possibly Coonawarra and Langhorne Creek. Okay. So, um, Mark, we've seen the last, since 2010, we're seeing Shiraz average prices coming up, for, but for most region, regions they are still generally back in that mid-90s scene. What, what's happening um, internationally? If you can see my first chart, you can see where Shiraz is actually ending up, and interestingly enough, Shiraz is one of the varietals where inter an international market is actually our biggest market. So the UK is number one. Of course, the UK gets used to the hub into Europe as well, but but um, as we saw earlier, the UK has been flat for a number of reasons. But if you aggregate all of the uh, Shiraz sales throughout the world, they were up 5%. And uh, I've broken this down into two segments as well. So I'm looking at commercial Shiraz, and I'm really just uh, labelling this to get an idea of, uh, of the two segments of the market. So commercial Shiraz, I'm looking at volumes, and this is really... Shiraz being sold for under $600 a tonne. When I look at the premium segment, that's above $600 a tonne, and I'll be looking at markets over $5 FOB. So back to Shiraz, um, over the last year, as I said, sales were up by 5%, and we produced about 5% more Shiraz in 2014. So on balance, stocks would have remained about even, and they would be at elevated levels. Uh, in, in the UK, Shiraz is up 9%, even though my chart uh, shows it is flat, that is export. So Shiraz is selling quite well in the market. However, offsetting that is the US, and Shiraz is really just not getting much traction there at the moment. So it's down 10% by value in the market. However, you can see that uh, China has grown quite strongly, and austerity that was announced in uh, late 2012 has really run its course and um, as one of the speakers earlier said, 2015, I think it was Brett, um, was, has been quite strong in China as well. And uh, yeah, the Chinese New Year has been strong. 
So if you jump to my premium slide. Um, if you look at premium exports, uh, the aggregate exports were up by 1% and the value is up 3%. And this is really China again uh, kicking in and they're really demanding some of our most premium wines. Again, uh, North America is really not getting a lot of traction with uh, high price shows. But as a whole, the stronger growth is at the premium end. Okay. Um, Jim, it's, it's interesting because if we look at that red line, that suggests over the last five years that really um, premium Shiraz, that is the, over the $600 a tonne, in terms of value has really only increased by about 2% a year and yet we're seeing some record prices being uh, paid in the Barossa. Give us your perspective on, on Shiraz. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, uh, it's almost uh, schizophrenic between Barossa and the rest of the country. Um, I'll break it up into four segments. The first segment um, I'd like to talk about is Southeast Australian Shiraz. Big crop in vintage 2013 uh, and again 14, or around about 425,000 tonnes, um, possibly a smaller crop this year. So that overhang of stock from the big crops has meant there's plenty of good bargains around for um, uh, commercial grade Southeast Australian Shiraz. Uh, in particular, vintage 2014, there's still uh, quite an abundant supply of that in the marketplace. Um, I'm a glass half, pool per, half full person, so I think that's always a good opportunity to introduce this particular varietal to new consumers, um, to new customers and new consumers. Um, uh, Australian Shiraz, Aust Shiraz is Australia's flagship variety, um, so in times of mild oversupply, um, then that's a, a good time to um, to introduce things like um, uh, entry-level wines that will introduce people that would otherwise not, not try it. Currently, I look at the demand supply balance and categorise it as mild oversupply for SEA Shiraz. And hot, warm or cold, in terms of a rating, I'd give it a warm-ish. Compare that to the Barossa. Uh, spring frost last year, spring frost the year before. Um, short crop at the end of a series of shortish crops. Um, a continued positive uh, influence for both corporate winemakers and smaller winemakers, artisan winemakers. There's a good population of those people in the Barossa wearing out shoe leather, um, <clears throat> taking their product to consumers here and overseas. Um, Ostwine, uh, a current um, supply demand balance, medium term under supply. Ostwine rating, clearly hot from our point of view. Um, the third segment I have a quick look at is McLaren Val Shiraz, smaller crop in 15 compared to 14. Um, it's often the next place that people go to if they can't get, say, Barossa Shiraz, a bit of a Napa Sonoma dynamic sort of happening there. Um, and that's uh, the demand for Barossa Shiraz is, I guess, underpinning the performance, um, the good price performance that we're seeing for McLaren Val Shiraz. Current demand supply balance, medium term balance. I'd give it a rating of warmish. And finally, Shiraz from other regions, plenty of inventory, especially C grade material. C grade material, I'd classify anything between that commands a retail price of $10 to $15 per bottle on the shelf. Um, current demand supply balance, clear oversupply. And I'd cat categorise that part of the Shiraz market as cold ish. Peter. Okay, so I'll, look, I'll, I'll sum up and then ask uh, Brett and Simon to comment. So it seems to me that, that it's clear that Barossa and uh, McLaren Vale ha are, sh are showing continued demand. We've got excess in inventory that's holding down prices in C grade and below, and we've also got a significant issue with declining demand in the US. China is, is up, uh, but of course what China is up is not compensating as yet for the downturn in, in the US. Um, I just wonder, uh, do you, Simon and Brett, perhaps Brett, do you agree with that analysis? And also, where does the 935 hectares of additional plantings come into play? So we're probably talking, what, roughly 7,000, 7,500 extra tonnes coming onto the, the market in the next couple of years. Is this a, is this a good thing, or, or, or what, what are your thoughts? Brett, if I start with you. Yeah, look, I think, um, <clears throat> I think overall, the way we see Shiraz is pretty much aligned with, with what we're seeing here. Um, I think Shiraz is probably the biggest opportunity for Australia. It's the biggest red varietal, as we know, but I think it's the biggest opportunity. It's probably the one variety that 
uh, we can call our own and that is uniquely Australian. Um, it is, obviously it's grown in other parts of the world, but it's, it's the one thing that, that we do well, uh, we do it broadly and we do it quite uniquely. So I think if you think about, uh, you know, Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc and Spanish Tempranillo and Napa Valley Cabernet, I think Australian Shiraz is, is what we can hang our hat on. So I think it's, I think it is the biggest opportunity and one that we probably need to take the most note of. Um, we see obviously the demand in the Barossa, but I think we've got to be careful of the economics in the Barossa as well, that uh, a lot of wine, you know, you can go down to the local retailer now and find Barossa Shiraz probably for 11 or $12 on the shelf, um, you know, paying $1,800, $2,000 a tonne, plus all the other costs that go with that, the economics don't add up. So I think what we are going to see is a, an increase in price on the shelf for Barossa Shiraz, uh, which I think is a good thing, um, but I still think there's very, very strong demand globally. Um, in Asia, um, from a red point of view, it's very much Cabernet dominant uh, because of the French influence that's been in there for a long, long time. Uh, Cabernet is probably still king, but again, Shiraz is selling quite well. So it's something that I think we can differentiate ourselves from the French um, and, and provide Shiraz that's good quality and, and, and very good value for the, the Chinese market. Okay. Uh, Jim, have you got any thoughts about that extra uh, fruit that's going to be coming onto the market? Is that a good, good thing? It really depends on where uh, those plantings are. Mainly in the Barossa, yeah. Um, well, clearly, given the current demand supply balance, um, that's ostensibly, uh, I guess, a good thing for those people that have seen it uh, fit to, to replant or graft or, or redevelop. Uh, if it was in the, any other region, I'd express some caution. OK. Simon, have you got any thoughts on Shiraz? Well, Shiraz to me is a growers variety. It's reliable, it's consistent, it responds well to things like shoot thinning, deficit, deficit irrigation, so you can trick it up and premiise it like you've seen. Uh, the people think that that's the way it's going. There are declining yields in many areas, so some of the plantings are replacing vineyards that are suffering from utipa and uh, decline. But I think you should also look at other varieties that fit that mould, such as Nero Diavola, Montepulciano and Barbera, and differentiate yourselves. Okay, let's move on to Cabernet. Sandy, give us the update on Cabernet. Um, the Cabernet, Cabernet crops about half the Shiraz crop, so like Brett said, Shiraz is our big thing. And the Cabernet crop was down by 10,000 tonnes, so that was a 10% decline. Um, average prices are pretty flat, or maybe trending up a little bit. In my weighted average price tables, that trend arrow that I've given is based across the last three years of prices, not just the gap between last year and this year. Um, and the, yeah, perhaps I'll put this on the table. I was a bit surprised to see 700 hectares of new plantings in the past two years of Cabernet. Um, 400 net increase, that's nearly as much as the Shiraz. 200 of that's in Coonawarra, I didn't track down the rest of it. But that's a bigger percentage increase in area than in the Shiraz, which, yeah, I wondered about. So uh, the next slide, Peter, we'll just go straight past this one. I think you can look back at the numbers here, except do note Barossa price for Cabernet is now $300 higher than the Coonawarra price. And looking at the chart on the next slide, um, you can see that illustrated again. You've got the historical pattern of, of Cabernet pricing there, looking a lot like the Shiraz pricing. So again, trending up since 2010. And I presume uh, a lot of... Particularly for the Brossa and, yeah. and maybe Claire, but less so yeah. for the others. Yeah, le lesser to, for the others, and I presume a lot of that Cabernet is replanting in, in, in Coonawarra. Um, Mark, so what's the, the picture domestically and internationally for, for Cabernet? So if we uh, look on aggregate, total sales of Cabernet were up 8% during the year. Uh, there was less grown over the last few years, so stocks would have declined over the last um, year. Uh, if you look at Australia, so the biggest market, about uh, 50 million litres being sold into the market, and uh, sales were flat. There's been a bit of a shift between uh, the straight varietal is selling quite well, but blends uh, pulling some of that uh, demand for the varietal back. 
Uh, if you go to the US, um, retail sales of Cabernet were down by 2%, but this was uh, relatively a better result than uh, Shiraz and, and Chardonnay, so not, not too bad there. Uh, in the UK, it's the opposite effect to Australia, uh, in Australia, so the uh, straight varietal is not selling that well, but some of the blends are up quite significantly. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Peter. Um, premium exports are doing quite well. As you can see, the um, average price for wine in the uh, $5 and above level has been increasing over the last few years, and this is really a uh, Hong Kong and China effect. Uh, on aggregate, exports up 12%, and um, that growth is stronger if you uh, go up the price um, segments. Um, in the US, where we are seeing the segment decline, we have actually seen the above $10 segment up by 30%. So hopefully, as the uh, US market sees we are doing some uh, good cabernets at the higher level, that will feed through into the uh, lower price segments. And so it seems that, in, it, interestingly, the Cabernet is, is, is doing better um, in terms of price increases and, and relatively in sales compared to Shiraz. Shiraz has been quite flat, but in that premium area of Cabernet, um, looking at those figures, where the value of Cabernet is up by about 40% in four years, where, interestingly, Shiraz was only up 10%. I think that's more of a Hong Kong effect. There's some quite expensive wines going into the market at the moment. OK, Jim. What are you seeing in terms of Cabernet? Um, I'll split Cabernet into three segments. Um, the first segment for commercial Cabernet or Southeast Australian Cabernet. Um, in our world, it struggles to compete with Cabernet from Chile. Um, Cabernet from Chile is often better value for money, and it's one of Chile's mainstay varieties. Uh, the advantage of Australian Cabernet um, is that it can be used in Shiraz Cabernet blends, which are, uh, often feature with entry-level wines. Sometimes those blends can change to Cabernet Shiraz with, um, with some ease, um, depending on the market balance and relative supply of each. Um, it's particularly important when you're trying to meet a price point. There was a big crop in uh, 13, uh, nearly a quarter of a million tonnes, and uh, an equally big crop of about 230,000 tonnes nationally um, in 14, which means that supply is likely to exceed demand uh, coming into 15, despite a slightly smaller crop uh, in 15. Supply of Cabernet, South Australian Cabernet, I'd characterise as being in slightly uh, better position than, say, Shiraz. Current demand supply balance um, I'd describe as mild oversupply, and hot, cold, warm, I'd give it coldish rating. Uh, next segment I'll talk about is Coonawarra Cabernet. Uh, despite its history and pedigree, um, it doesn't enjoy the same uh, recognition as, say, Barossa Shiraz. Um, there's reasonably abundant inventory levels uh, in the marketplace of bulk Cabernet. And interestingly, Barossa Cabernet grapes this year, uh, the price exceeded Coonawarra Cabernet, uh, the price of grapes. Um, uh, that's a real tragedy for Coonawarra Cabernet, it breaks my heart um, and leads me to, I guess, characterise the current uh, demand supply balance as mild oversupply for Coona Cab. Um, and I'd give it a rating for that reason of coldish. Cabernet from other regions, plenty of inventory, particularly C grade. Um, current demand supply balance oversupply. And again, a rating from our point of view, uh, coldish. Okay, so um, summing up in terms of Cabernet, from what I'm, I'm hearing you all, all saying is that um, the, the part from the Barossa, the rest of the, of the state is pretty flat in terms of price and demand. We've, uh, I noticed looking back at the, at the figures that Sandy gave that we've seen uh, you know, places like the, the Riverland uh, and Langhorne Creek see, see quite significant falls. Uh, in, in terms of, of price, so um, that, that's a concern for, for people growing in those areas, how they're going to manage that, whether they will increase their, their crop and that will, whether that then, of course, then increases the supply. Sandy, uh, Peter, can I just add, um, and I'll draw your attention to these pretty coloured tables. These are uh, uh, just an analysis of comparative varieties. The point about Cabernet is that Often the yields are low, so 
the, um, the gross return per hectare can be quite poor. And in Clare, Langhorne Creek, and not Coonawarra, Pathway, for example, it's, it's the lowest gross return per hectare of any of the varieties. So there is that extra problem with it. Simon, you've got a comment about Cabernet? I agree with, I agree with Sandy that it's a fickle variety for set. It has different management inputs. It needs more water. It can really scare you with yields if it gets overripe and someone is seeking a higher alcohol content, so that can really give you a fright. It really doesn't sit in a portfolio of recommendations for, from myself as a consultant or a grower. Because? Because of those reasons, it can, it can give you a fright and, and really lose some serious money for you because okay. of its inherent lack of vigour, inability to deal with things like Utiper and Phomopsis in, in tough conditions and for some of the sort of more austere management input things. It's, um, it's not a very grower-friendly variety. Okay. Brett, any thoughts? Viticulturally, there's, there's challenges, as Simon said. I mean, we've also, you know, we see it regularly that from a wine quality point of view and a style point of view, there's, there's a lot more ups and downs with, with Cabernet Sauvignon, particularly in hot, you know, hot vintages in Australia, which is probably most of them. Um, so it is, it is more challenging, but I think there is, you know, there is an opportunity, particularly in Asia, it was pretty much linked to what I said before, that, that they look at Cabernet Sauvignon as the number one red variety. So um, while I think... Shiraz is a thing that we can do uniquely. We can't ignore Cabernet in that market and we should be supplying it. And also I think the, you know, we've seen this as well from our business, the, the increasing ask for Barossa Cabernet um, has grown a lot in the last couple of years. So, so what, what we're seeing in these figures doesn't surprise us at all. And is that demand for Barossa Cabernet, is that because it's got a, a different flavour profile or is it because of the, the region association? Oh, it's probably a couple of things. I think it's the because Shiraz is getting tight and the Barossa name has recognition, so if you can't get Shiraz, you can, you can get some Cabernet. But I think from a, a flavour and style point of view, um, it, it's much richer and riper and softer generally than, than say, some of the cooler climate areas, or true cooler climate areas. So... Uh, for a lot of consumers, again, particularly in Asia, it's probably a more approachable and an easier drink for them. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's have a look at Merlot. Sandy, what happened with Merlot this year? Uh, well, and probably the first thing to say about Merlot is that Crush was 40,000 tonnes compared with 200 for Shiraz. So, and this is the third red variety. So it, it's, it's, there's really a big drop from the first two to the third one. The crop was down slightly. Average prices were actually up. Um, Barossa price up by and, or nearly $200. Um, but there have been no significant new plantings in the past two years. In fact, there's been a net decrease in area of 100 hectares in 4,000. Um, if you move on to the next one, Peter, that shows you the weighted average prices. Um, but I, yeah, for me, there was sort of not a lot to see here. Okay. All right. Thanks. We'll then move on to Mark. Hopefully he's got something to see. Yeah, I've got a few words. Um, so aggregate sales were up 7% over the last year and the crop has been down over the last two years. So we should have seen some improvement in the stock position of the varietal. Um, in Australia, our biggest market, when the chart gets out, there it is. Uh, sales were down 2 to 6% in the past year, so domestically not travelling too well. But offsetting that decline is the UK, and sales were up 16% during the year, so really some nice growth coming through there. Um, how the US still not travelling too well, uh, down by 9% in the retail section. However, you can see in my export chart, um, exports were up slightly over the last financial year. Uh, yeah, and the premium uh, on aggregate down 1%. Uh, prices have been flat to declining over the last five years. And we need to remember that not only are we producing a lot less Merlot, but the premium market for Merlot is just 8% of uh, what Shiraz has. However, um, there has been strong growth at the higher price segment. So a few markets, Hong Kong's been travelling well, and uh, interestingly enough, Norway's popped up in there this year. 
Um, Canada's also a strong market for those um, mid mid segments. So the five to seven fifty is quite strong in Canada and has been growing as my chart shows. But China, not really being affected by the um, the end to the austerity. However, there is some growth in the in the highest price points for Merlot. Jim, from your perspective, Merlot difficult variety. Um, yeah, I'll split Merlot into just two segments, um, difficult and harder still. Um, Southeast Australian commercial Merlot uh, really struggles to compete with Merlot from Chile. Um, they can often do it uh, uh, basically better value for money. It is Chile's, uh, one of Chile's mainstay varieties with Cabernet and Sauvignon Blanc, the other two. Um, the reality is most of our exports do go to the EU. Um, we've signed some free trade agreements with emerging, emerging markets and China's obviously a, a very bright light there. But um, Chile has beaten us to all those markets uh, with free trade agreements. And importantly, they have a free trade agreement with the EU. Um, it, in our world, it's worth about 12 euro cents a litre. Now, you might think that's not very important. But when you calculate that back, to the farm gate that's somewhere between $120 and $150 per tonne that we could be delivering to growers as an industry um, that Chile can and we can't because of the tariff regimes that are in place. Um, so if there's a job to do with our politicians, um, I'd take the opportunity to underscore a free trade agreement with the EU. I know these things are complicated, but Merlot really highlights the difficulty that Australia faces. Um, we're not well known for it. Um, our prices are higher. Um, a lot of Merlot is going to end up as blending wine. It already is. Um, there is a good opportunity since prices are low and there's abundant supply. Uh, personally, I'm not so convinced. I sort of had to force that one out, being the et uh, eternal optimist. Current supply balance for Southeast Australian Merlot um, clear oversupply and I'd rate it as, on the current settings, policy settings, cold. Merlot from everywhere else, um, well that struggles full stop, I think, in our world at least. Um, it has the worst fundamental outlook for the three main varieties, uh, three main red varieties, Shiraz, Cab and Merlot, uh, based on the, the available planting resource versus the market opportunity as um, we can currently define it. And there's plenty of inventory in the marketplace, especially of C grade. Um, current supply-demand balance for non-SEA regional Merlot is clear oversupply and warm, hot or cold, I'd characterise it as ice cold. OK. Brett, any, th any thoughts? We seem to have struggled actually growing Merlot. Um, we've seen new clones come in, but is it, is it got a future as a standalone varietal or is it always going to be a blender? Yeah, look, I think we... You know, we sell quite a bit of varietal Merlot um, and quite a lot of Merlot blended with Cabernet. Uh, but we probably haven't seen growth in either of those blends for probably seven or eight years now. So um, for us, it's just ticking along, filling a, a, a spot in the market. Um, as Jim said, there's a lot of competition for Merlot who do it um, probably a lot cheaper than we do and, and arguably are making some very, very smart wines even compared to ours. So, um, you know... I think Merlot will probably just continue roughly where it is. I don't see it being a huge growth opportunity um, going forward. Um, I think what we have seen, though, is some of the new clones that have come in more recently that, that we have planted and trialled um, are giving us far better wines um, than, than some of the more traditional clones. So I think that's, that's a good sign, but um, I still think there's much more opportunity in other reds, Cabernet and Shiraz. Simon, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm the same as Jim. It's two camps, Husqvarna or Still. Get rid of it. If you're planted more than 1.8 metres in row, it has been proven to be quite a surprisingly useful understock for a medium vigour or better red, but it, it doesn't have a place in your vineyard. Get rid of it. Um, so, Sandy, tell us about the Chardonnay. Uh, well, the crop was up 14,000 tonnes or 10% across the state, and yet supply is still a bit tight. If I can bring in my other winery research, which you'll hear about in a little while. Um, uh, and that 147,000, that puts it right in the middle between Shiraz and Cabernet as our number two variety in South Australia. And weighted average prices were up in a lot of the regions, or flat. 
Um, but we've seen a net decrease in area of 500 hectares in the last two years. Or maybe it isn't a but, maybe that's the because. Um, just looking at those weighted average prices, they weren't moving up, but they were moving in a positive direction in, in many regions. Quite interestingly, even me thinking last year when we were in this room, I probably wasn't expecting that was going to happen this year. Uh, if you could just show the next one, Peter, it's, just, it's sort of a little bit of an aside. This is not just about Chardonnay, but if you look at that chart, you can see all the new plantings, which are in red. So the red are reds and the green are whites. And on the whole, of course, we're getting new plantings in reds and at, at the expense of whites. And interestingly enough, there's really no net change in South Australia, is, is there a total planting? Very, very little net change. OK, well, we've seen um, quite a bit come out. Mark, is that having any impact in terms of uh, uh, commercial Chardonnay? Well, uh, yeah, despite the plantings, uh, well, the, the vineyard area being reduced and a series of lower crushes, um, sales are actually up 2% over the last financial year. So we should see stocks declining, although uh, the 2015 crush was up significantly. Uh, if you look at the Australian sales, so our biggest market, after years of decline, uh, Chardonnay is flat, so that's good news that it's not declining anymore. And there's actually been a bit of a shift, even though cask wine sales are declining, um, cask Chardonnay is increasing, so um, premiumisation in the cask market. So that's interesting. Uh, in the US, uh, Chardonnay's not um, faring too well. So um, you can see exports had declined, and that's on the back of an 8% decline in retail sales. Uh, the US has had a series of large crops, and they do grow a lot of Chardonnay. So that would be impacted by that as well. Um, if you look at the UK, sales increased by 3% to uh, 35 million cases, and that's about um, odd litres, sorry. Um, that's about on par with the market growth for Australia. Um, and this chart also highlights the fact that um, China really isn't uh, buying a lot of our white wines at this stage. So down at number eight, where we have seen it's been at about fourth position um, if we had to take a look at premium Chardonnay, uh, exports were down 9% in, uh, in total volumes. However, the prices have been increasing over the last few years. So we have seen a bit of growth at the above $10 uh, segment. So that was up 8%. And uh, part of this is the UK. So the UK is really going well for, for our premium wines. I think as a category, it was up about 38%. And uh, there's been some really good feedback from uh, Chances Robinson, for instance, one of the world's great wine critics, has claimed Australia is making some of the most exciting Chardonnay at the moment. So uh, there's a few other trends in, in the UK that are going in favour of some of these um, premium Chardonnays. Um, as the large retailers reduce the amount of SKUs that they've got available for the consumers, it's actually opened up opportunities for the independent retailers and that segment of the UK market is actually growing again. And uh, we know that these, um, these retailers are more willing to take on uh, more and more exciting wines that are um, regional in nature. So some good trends in uh, the UK and Europe as well. So, uh, Jim, we're not doing well in the US. And also, why does Chardonnay have this great volatility more than, it seems to me, than most varieties in terms of price? Yeah, good question. Um, from our observations, um, Chardonnay certainly has more volatility because once you crush it and make it, uh, in our world at least, at the commercial end, you really have to find a buyer for it by year's end. Um, One-year-old Chardonnay um, is not much fun to uh, market and probably not, much, not as much fun for the consumer to uh, to drink uh, sometime after that. Uh, compare that to Shiraz, Cabernet, um, where you've probably got 12 to 18 months um, to find a market, and now with the emergence of China, probably even longer. Um, so what that drives uh, winemakers um, thinking in terms of 
uh, I've got too much Chardonnay, I'm not going to sell it by year end, therefore I'm going to reduce the price that I can pay um, for Chardonnay grapes the following year. So we see a very volatile reaction and very fast reaction, which we tend not to see um, with red varieties. Okay, and what about uh, the, its performance looking at South East Australia? Um, a couple of pretty big crops, um, particularly in vintage 2013. Nationally, it was a 400,000 tonne crop. Um, that spells pain for everyone. Um, in the bulk market, prices were just horrible. Um, and that translated to pretty ordinary prices at the farm gate. 2014 was a shorter crop, significantly shorter, nearly 50,000 tonnes shorter uh, nationally. Um, our problem as, uh, as exporters and intermediaries was that uh, People have gotten used to the very low prices of V13 Chardonnay uh, and were unwilling to accept any price rises um, out of uh, 14 vintage. Better news out of 15, um, crop was around the same in Mildura. Um, a little bit up in the Riverland, 13%. Significantly up in Griffith, although Griffith doesn't have a huge Chardonnay uh, vineyard area. And I think it might be a happy coincidence with the re declining Australian dollar that we've been able to get price rises uh, for Chardonnay at the commercial end, uh, at least to some extent. Um, Chardonnay stocks, are, current vintage Chardonnay stocks are pretty low in the industry at the moment, um, perhaps with the exception of Griffith. Um, uh, and I think that's probably a function of the low prices that were experienced a couple of years ago, um, perhaps have opened up new markets and new drinkers to this variety. Um, there's been a lot of vineyard removal. Uh, it's almost a third in the five years to 2013 where we have da data available from 30,000 hectares to 23,000 hectares. Um, people will recall that the fundamentals for Chardonnay were quite bad for a period of time there uh, leading up to the 14 vintage. Um, happily though, uh, Chardonnay is Australia's most famous white varietal, so on that basis I'd classify it as sort of warmish and on a supply-demand balance I'd uh, characterise it as emerging balance. Um, if we move to other regions, um, Chardonnay which faithfully reflects um, its origin I think is, and I'm going to go out on a bit of a limb here, um, I think it's a leading contributor to what I describe as Australia's wine renaissance. Um, opinion leaders are talking about it. Um, Chardonnay is pretty forgiving in the winery. There's lots of, uh, of winemaking expressions that it can lend itself to. And we've got a fantastic array of suitable sites um, for this variety. So for premium Chardonnay, current supply demand uh, uh, balance, I would say emerging balance, and I'd rate it as warmish. Okay, so Brett, where, do, where does Chardonnay fit with you guys? Are you starting to see demand coming back in? We've been talking about red varieties for a number of years as the dominance. Yep, uh, look, I think the demand for Chardonnay has really never gone away. Um, it's uh, probably three times the size of any other white varietal that we make, so it, it's huge for us, uh, huge in importance. And I, I really echo Jim's comments there about we're starting to see a lot of interest at the, the more premium end in Chardonnay internationally. So I think Australia nationally makes a terrific variation of styles and qualities of Chardonnay. Um, again, we can do a lot more than, say, one region in France can do. We can do lots of different things right across the country. Um, so I think we've got a lot to offer in terms of Chardonnay. Um, commercially, uh, our baseline sales are very, very stable over a number of years now, so we do very well with, with Jacobs Creek Classic Chardonnay. Probably one thing that doesn't get talked a lot about is, is the use of Chardonnay in sparkling. So traditionally, Chardonnay makes up a big component of sparkling wine, and I think, again, in the last five to seven years, we've seen quite a large drop-off of traditional sparkling wine sales and being replaced by things like Moscato and Prosecco and, and even non-varietal sparkling that's got some sort of sexy name. So that's probably had an impact on, on Chardonnay demand, which is probably something that's not given a lot of airtime. So we think Chardonnay's got a great future, both commercially and in the premium sector, and you know, we're, we're well into it and echo the comments that um, I think it's a, it's a big opportunity in a lot of markets. Simon, any comments? Uh, I'm a big Chardonnay fan. I see it as being very reliable in the vineyard as long as you get your early powdery control sorted out. I'll echo those thoughts that they're saying about how it can attract a high value wine. It can handle oak, it can handle barrel ferments, malolactic, oxidative handling, the whole lot. This is a variety for me that I implore the winemakers and the marketers to put on the top 
of their reinvent and invigorate list. I think we can do more with it. Okay, thank you. And we're running out of time, so we'll see how we go. We're going to look at Sauvignon Blanc, the villain of the Australian wine industry, perhaps. Um, Sandy, Sauvignon Blanc. Okay, so we're talking a total of 30,000 tonnes here. So uh, two, th uh, what's that, three quarters of the Merlot. Um, the crush was up slightly in the Riverland, but generally very similar. Price is generally flat. Um, I understand that perhaps yields were affected by smoke taint in the Adelaide Hills. Um, yeah, but I think perhaps surprisingly, we'll see, depending on what the rest of, of the people here say, but you know, we've actually lost a, a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc in the last two years, 80 hectares, which has gone from Brossa and McLaren Vale. Perhaps that's not too surprising that that's gone to, to Reds, but also 35 hectares gone from the Adelaide Hills. Um, the weighted average prices, as I said, pretty flat. You can uh, refer to them afterwards. Mark, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, so sales were up 5% overall. Uh, I lose a bit of visibility when it comes to this varietal. As you can see, Australia's the biggest market and uh, our export knowledge is uh, a lot better than the domestic market knowledge for a few reasons. But um, in the Australian, Australian sales of uh, Sav Blanc, uh, there was a bit of a, a shift in the dynamics there. Uh, the imported section was flat and uh, Australian Sav Blanc started to win some market share but it's my understanding that a lot of this was uh, private labels, so the Woolworths, et cetera, trying to reduce their cost of goods and um, yeah, use Australian products. In the US, uh, sales were up 4%, but we've only got about a 1% market share compared to 5% for Chardonnay, so we're not really known for the varietal. Uh, same goes for the UK. It was up 15%, but just 10% market share, with, where there's uh, Chardonnay, we've got about half the market there. Um, if you go to my next chart, uh, I've just got a snapshot of uh, New Zealand Sav Blanc imports into the country. Um, as I said, they were, sales were flat in uh, the last year. However, you can see a surge of bulk Sav Blanc come in uh, in the last couple of months. So this might have been clearing stocks um, in, uh, to make way for the 2015 vintage. However, the New Zealand uh, crush was down 27%, so this should be a positive for Australia as well. Uh, if you go to the premium slide, uh, uh, yes, yeah, like I said, New Zealand really owns this space. Total exports are up 2% though, uh, prices were slightly down, and Canada is really the uh, main market here and growing as well. Um, Japan is going quite strongly uh, with the free trade agreement in place. It's really driven along um, some of Australia's high price sales as well, even though it's been a uh, bulk wine that's been the main beneficiary at this stage. Jim, we produce great Sauvignon Blanc at every price point. What are you seeing? Um, we just start with uh, commercial grade Chardonnay. During the course of harvest, we saw quite a bit of, I guess, I wouldn't describe it as frantic, but it was certainly brisk buying activity for grapes out of 15. And alongside with that, out of the existing vintage 14 stocks, uh, especially in the inland irrigated regions. Uh, my take on that was uh, uh, demand driven uh, by increased sales in the, in the domestic market and to a lesser extent uh, in the UK market by the major wine companies. Australian Sauvignon Blanc also suffers from strong competition from Chile. It's the same old uh, price value relationship, which we tend to always come the worst out of when we go head to head with Chile. Um, interesting dynamic with Sauvignon Blanc in Australia is the interplay with the size of the New Zealand crop and the fundamentals over here, um, which can influence the volume of Australian Sauvignon Blanc that goes back to New Zealand for domestic consumption. Um, interesting graph that uh, Mark put up earlier about the surge in New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc imports into Australia. I suspect that might be as Australian importers scrambled to get their supply over here, um, lest it may disappear uh, into blending and stretching the V15 wines out of New Zealand. Uh, so that was my take on that. Short term undersupply uh, would be uh, the current demand supply balance um, assessment. And I'd rate it warm but hot today. 
If you look at Sauvignon Blanc uh, from the Adelaide Hills, um, more abundant in 15 compared to 14. There was a pretty short crop there in 14. Uh, again, <coughs> uh, suffers from the growth of Sauvignon Blanc uh, from New Zealand um, during the last decade, um, and currently a reasonable amount of inventory available. Um, I guess if we take a view that New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc imports will eventually stabilise, and perhaps we've seen that with the exception of that little blip at the end, uh, I'd categorise the demand supply balance as emerging balance, as the Adelaide Hills, I guess, tries to recarve its niche as a Sauvignon Blanc producer, um, and I'd describe it as warmish. Sauvignon Blanc from WA. Um, We've had quite abundant supply. Uh, WA does Sauvignon Blanc pretty well. Um, in fact, we've had quite abundant supply of most West Australian whites over the last few years. Also suffering from New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Um, the extra difficulty that West Australian uh, whites and Sauvignon Blanc uh, face is the extraordinary cost of freight to get it here. Um, 30, 40, 50 cents a litre, depending on which part of the uh, eastern seaboard you're going to, and that limits its ability to be, I guess, blended away into lower value products uh, while the adjustment is going on. Uh, short term oversupply, um, but again, um, I would describe it as warmish as it reestablishes itself uh, in, the, in the face of eventual um, stabilisation of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc imports. Simon, any do I dare ask you if you've got any comments about Sauvignon Blanc? You can. I think it's very reliable in a range of districts across uh, South Australia. It's become a reliable, fast-moving consumer good on the market, and to that end, it's good for wineries from a cash flow point of view because they can often have their current vintage out before they've paid for the fruit under South Australian conditions, and that's fine. It does need more resources thrown at it to grow shaded fruit, and in the cooler climates, you really do need to cane prune it. But I think what we need to do is get ourselves organised to combat the import of Sauvignon Blanc and get people engaged in our own styles and our own offerings. So that's the challenge. Thank you. Brett, any thoughts? Yeah, look, I, th I think um, Sauvignon Blanc, this might be, sound a bit strange, but I think it's probably a story more about um, New Zealand and Chile rather than Australia. So as we know, as soon as in New Zealand... Um, vintage is high, um, we're getting flooded in Australia, so that's having a direct impact on Australian sales because most consumers, if they can go into a store and they can spend $10 on an Australian Sauvignon Blanc or $10 on a Marlborough or New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, they tend to go to the New Zealand offering. Um, and there is a difference in, in style and, and quality as well that we, we can see quite clearly. So, and with Chile, it's, you know, they're producing very, very good Sauvignon Blanc at a, at a very sharp price commercially, which we struggle to compete with. So. I think the outlook's still positive for Sauvignon Blanc. Consumers are, are picking it up and it's growing globally, um, but I think we just have to, to keep a good, good eye on New Zealand um, and try and find our niche in the market and, and work with that. But I think overall positive, but um, a lot of influence coming from particularly New Zealand. Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting that there isn't massive plantings in, in the Riverland, but it's actually is the highest grossing variety this year in the, in the Riverland, followed by Pinot Noir. Um, we'll have to leave it at that point, unfortunately, but as I say, this, we've never done this before. We weren't quite sure how long it would take, but can you please um, thank the, the panel members for their contributions, and we hope you found that useful. You want to...